Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Welcome to the Muslim Philanthropy Podcast at American Muslim Community Foundation. My name is Muthi Khwaja, and today we have on Patty Walsh from CARE Minnesota. She is the Development Director. Welcome to the show, Patty. Thank you very much for having me, Mohai. I really appreciate your asking me on. Of course. Um, so, you know, on the show, we love to get a sense of the nonprofits that we support, the nonprofit leaders who are there. Um, tell everybody a little bit more about yourself and your background. Sure. Uh, well, well, we'll start with my origins. <laughs> I'm from New Jersey and Detroit, kind oh, of a nice. weird background. Uh, I'm, it's a long story how I landed here, but uh, I've been in Minnesota since 1984, so uh, I, I feel like a Minnesotan now. Um, <laughs> but uh, my background, my career background, uh, have not always been in nonprofits. I'm in my second career, actually. Uh, I've got a a background as a legal administrative assistant and I kind of um, well I lost lost the job several years ago and went back to school um, and wound up with a with a, a certificate in public relations I wound up interning at a Somali women's organization advocacy organization and I interned there and um, it turned out that the uh, I interned there and while I was there it turns out I'm, I was pretty good at grant writing and um, so they didn't have a spot for me to hire me there, but uh, the CARE Minnesota development job opened up and the executive director at ISRU in the Somali um, ad women's organization knew the uh, Jelani Hussein, our executive director at CARE. And uh, so that was kind of my in and I interviewed there and I've been there for almost five years now. That's awesome. So in a nutshell. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, you know, definitely intrigued by the Detroit part because I was born and raised in Detroit. Um, yes, yes. Uh, and, um, you know, I think for development directors and grant writers in specific, like especially they bring such a much needed perspective to nonprofit organizations. And, you know, we often talk a lot about um, the significance of um, building relationships with foundations and having them support more Muslim-led initiatives. Um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit more about like some of the foundations or private family foundations you're applying to and mm -hmm. kind of building that relationship for Muslim-led institutions like CARE. Well, I, I think um, what I've learned it, in all of this, this five years that I've, that I've been there, that it's all about relationships um, we have we are very very fortunate uh, here at care minnesota to have some really wonderful relationships with our program officers at uh, several uh pretty pretty good big big sized uh, local foundations the bush foundation headwaters uh which is a so mainly social justice organization uh blue cross blue shield of minnesota that's just to name a few and, and this really is all about relationship building as well as donors as well, but, but really with the foundations, it's very, very critical I've found to, um, you know, just have the program officers really take an interest in what we do and make it very clear to them because they're not the ones actually deciding, uh, you know, who, who gets the grants or not, but they, they're very influential with usually the the board the, the board or the panel who's reviewing the grant applications and their um, their opinion about the applicant is usually very critical and and they can kind of their say so I think is very influential I think as far as getting the grant or not getting the grant and then I think years and years of building that relationship is is just critical to um, the success of whether you're going to be funded or not. So yeah, it's, it's very critical. Yeah, I can definitely understand that. And, you know, over the last few years, you've done a great job of introducing CARE Minnesota to American Muslim Community Foundation uh, and also other CARE chapters across the country. Um, mm -hmm. So tell, tell me a little bit more about your involvement. You mentioned that you've been with CARE Minnesota about five years. Um, and, you know, how did CARE Minnesota start? Um, if you want to go back into also a sure. little bit of CARE National for, for our listeners. Sure. Well, CARE National is, uh, we're, we're basically like a nonprofit franchise, if you will. CARE National is located in Washington, D.C., and we have 35 chapters across the U U.S. Um, we, um, 
we have been around, Care Minnesota started in uh, 2007 after a group of Minnesota Muslims had been um, facing some discrimination themselves and heard about a lot of discrimination going on. There was a lot of discrimination as you know, you're know, you aware of after, uh, uh, after 9-11. And I, I think it took a couple of years to get it going, but, but then in 2007, uh, they incorporated and started a chapter here. Uh, it was about you know seven individuals who got it started, and um, Jelani's actually just our second executive director there. So it's it's really um, we've really grown, and we're still growing. And um, each chapter, of it, what I've found is is extremely different. You're from Michigan originally, Dearborn, Michigan has got a completely different makeup of the Muslim community than, than uh, Minneapolis does. It's, it's remarkable. And uh, I, I've been involved with grants training for Care National. Every chapter, um, like in, in Michigan, for example, um, they, they, don't, they hardly get any grants. Uh, most, most of their funding does come in from donors, but the Muslim community there are well-established and um, you know uh, have uh, deep pockets, if you will. And so they, they can afford to be funded by donors mainly. Um, so I've been kind of guiding a lot of different chapters on how to do grant research, how to go about um, approaching uh, foundations. I think here in Minnesota, we're very extremely fortunate to have a really, really strong uh, and generous philanthropic um, community here. Um, and I'm not sure what the situation is in a lot of other states, um, but uh, we've been very fortunate here in Minnesota to have just a very generous uh, community. Um, we are, what we're looking at right now is we've got one national funder who's taken an interest in us and, um, and, and just the immigrant uh, community here. Thank you, Ilhan Omar, <laughs> and um, we're sh kind of shining a light on the state of Minnesota. And um, we are trying to make way, make our way into the Ford Foundation and some of the larger national foundations. That's kind of a goal of mine um, as we move forward into 2021. That's great. And, you know, having lived in the San Francisco Bay Area the last seven years, I've gotten to know the leadership here. And I know that, mm -hmm. um, you know, places like Silicon Valley Community Foundation support. And um, it's great to see that these mainstream philanthropic institutions are starting to um, give to the Muslim community. That's and, wonderful, yeah. You know, my argument is, you know, if Muslims make up 1% of the national population, are Muslim-led charities receiving 1% of philanthropic dollars? Um, yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of opportunity there. I think that from the $450 billion that uh, is Americans gave in 2019, um, you know, 90 some percent comes from individuals, uh, but right. foundations make up a, a certain percentage of that. And corporate giving is only about 5%. So when yeah. people think about the different pockets of funding, you know, they, as you said, it's all about relationship building. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there's a really big opportunity for the Muslim community to receive funding from uh, these mainstream philanthropic institutions. And I Absolutely. think it's great that you're trying to build relationships with the Ford Foundations and other. Um, so in, in regards to um, just like the leadership at CARE, like, you know, phenomenal leaders across the country. Um, yes. I've known um, Dawood Walid from being in Michigan for a long time and Lena Musri moved on to the national staff from there. Right, I love them, yeah. um, and even Care Florida was just recognized as a nominee for outstanding nonprofit from AMCF mm -hmm. uh, for our philanthropy awards. Um, so, you know, how, t tell us a little bit more about uh, some of the challenges that Care as a national organization and as you mentioned as like a franchisee almost um, mm -hmm. kind of faces in the nonprofit sphere i'm sure you know it's susceptible to all the challenges that we all face um, sure. but if you could generalize uh kind of what you feel some of the biggest challenges are for for care or just some of these muslim-led institutions in general sure well i i think for care minnesota in particular uh because of how our community is, um, 
I think that um, this year, obviously COVID, um, like, you know, everyone is challenged with the lockdown and everything. What, what, we, what we have done, our response to it initially was uh, our executive director um, immediately listened to a lot of uh, the community leaders, mosque leaders, imams and so forth. Um, in a lot of discussions uh, regarding um, them having the possibility of them not being able to make payments on their buildings. That was kind of the discussion at first and uh, because they, they couldn't hold Juma on Fridays and that was how they were doing their fundraising. Um, and so we were able to uh, partner with Propel for Nonprofits and get a $200,000 grant from the Minnesota, Minnesota Disaster Relief Fund. And we wow. split that between 43 mosques That's who uh, mainly represent uh, low income uh, immigrants. So that, that was really substantial. Uh, we've done um, weekly uh, Facebook live events. Um, I think we're still doing some uh, just regard having frontline workers, Muslim doctors mainly, um, you know, getting on Facebook Live and giving questions, you know, doing question, you know, kind of a, a panel and then uh, doing question and answer sessions with the community. So th those are a couple things we've been doing with regard to COVID. And, and then, um, you know, we're in Minneapolis, so we, we've had um, a respo our response to George Floyd's uh, killing has been, was immediate and, um, we have been leading a coalition of social justice organizations um, in the uh, Justice for George Floyd Coalition is what it's turned into. Um, and that's uh, with communities united against police brutality, uh, Black Lives Matter of Minnesota, Justice for Jamal Clark and some other organizations. So we're working on police report reform, not just for the city of Minneapolis, but things that can be reformed that can happen throughout the state of Minnesota, because there, there is, uh, you know, problems throughout the state. And this is, I, you know, I guess you could say like, well, how does this relate to Muslims exactly? And um, we, we really do view it as, a, you know, this is a civil rights issue. And we are a civil rights organization and civil rights, when they are being violated for anybody, it, it affects everyone. So we're very right. involved in, in police reform and trying to make sustainable policy change at uh, the city and county and state level. Um, so I, I think those are the things that, that maybe do set us apart a little bit from, um, from other chapters at, at the moment, um, just at this point in time, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, having the state or city based chapters is so effective. And, you mm -hmm. know, it takes a large network for, for you to do that. Um, and, you know, you were talking about donors with deep pockets or foundations that really invest in the local community. And mm -hmm. I think having local presence makes all the difference as well. Um, yes. So I think the fact that Jelani, yourself, the rest of the team is embedded in the Minneapolis community and our surrounding areas across the state allows you to then approach um, those foundations and say, hey, we're, we're right in your backyard. This is what we're doing. We're protecting the rights of all Americans and mm -hmm. have a lens on the American Muslim community. Um, right. So, you know, tell us about kind of how some of those relationships have evolved over time in terms of just showcasing the fact that the Muslim communities is there part and parcel with uh, the social justice movements of the city. Sure. Well, I, I think um, a lot of it is uh, I, I think um, it's it's taken a couple of couple of people couple of program officers it takes some convincing sometimes um and and then um, i i guess both jelani and i kind of work at some of these people and we go at it in a couple of different ways we go at it with different discussions i guess um it's kind of a two-pronged attack i guess or a pro let me not say attack i'll say approach <laughs> and um there are some program officers um i'm not going to name the foundations but there's some local foundations who have this idea of what we are 
and I think it's been it's been interesting over the last few years to like kind of prove to them like no like what we're doing really does affect the whole community we are associated with different social justice organizations and, and it's not just about lately the the murder of George Floyd but we have always been leading social justice organizations and I think the thing that right. I think that the thing that that it is interesting and, and a factor in all of this is that a lot of other social justice organizations are all volunteers. And the thing about care is that we have a couple of staff members who are paid staff people who are keeping the social justice movement alive. Um, and, and uh, you know, the volunteers who run these other social justice organizations, they're very, very committed and everything. But I think there is something to that to have a paid staff person um, working on coordinating and providing conferences and doing the, the actual coordination that I, I think is is kind of critical to, to all this work. Um, uh, I, I think that, um, I don't know, I'm kind of meandering now about it, but, but working with the program officers has been, and staying in close touch, meeting with them, I mean, pre-COVID, sure. doing a lot of lunch meetings and coffee meetings and stuff like that has been um, very critical. And we don't always, you know, it's hard to make time for all that, but it's mm -hmm. been very necessary. Um, one thing that's been really great this year is that we have, I've been a one person um, development shop up until been this there. year. We've hired <laughs> uh, Kate, who's our new fund development manager. She's going to take awesome. on more of the fundraising uh, donor, donor kind of stuff. We're sharing uh, uh, duties right now. We're kind of still defining like the, th the duties that she's going to do. I'm going to keep on with, with the grant stuff and the foundation mm -hmm. relationships um, but that's going to be brilliant because I, I'm going to be able to, uh, you know, work on the national foundations and yeah. to continue with the relationships that we've already got with local foundations. But it, because it needs to be stewarded constantly, just as, as the donors all need to be stewarded as well. Of course. So I wanted to ask, like, for any of the handful of foundations, like, how often are you reaching out? What are the, mm -hmm. you know, when you when you secure the meeting, what does that kind of look like for other mm -hmm. nonprofits that maybe are trying to do the same thing and could sure, learn from sure. your best practices? Well, I, I think it's, it's a matter of um, staying on top of the research. I always have a development intern who's uh, doing research for us, how we might be, I give the, the, the development or intern will have a, a list of criteria that I give them, um, you know, on, on what what to be researching. We use the foundation directory online, which is uh, Care National pays for a subscription for us. It's been, I think it's one of the best um, research tools that we can have. We also use GrantWatch. Yeah. We use GrantWatch too. And, but I think, I think foundation directory online has been one of the best tools that we've used. But I get, I get the research lists in uh, provided by the intern and I look for deadlines and I try to get a hold of people well before the deadlines. Um, I, I don't um, I don't call up a program officer a week before a grant is due. Um, it's a lot of preparation. It's a lot yeah. of following up on the research. Uh -huh. And usually I start with an email introducing us if they if they've never heard of us um, I did this recently not not that long ago um, you know really 2019 with a, uh, a a smaller family foundation located in St. Cloud Minnesota um, and the the process of this was getting the ear of the program officer um, getting her interested in, in a meeting. Now, this was all done long distance, um, but I did have an initial uh, virtual meeting with her that went very well. And then we set up another conference between um, Jelani and our deputy director and myself. And then, um, you know, evidently we, we won her over <laughs> and then I sent a letter of intent and then we were uh, asked to do a full a full grant application, and then and then we got the award, uh, and, and it was not a huge grant. It was ten thousand dollars, but mm -hmm. it, it opens up the door, of course, to further funding and and um, and, and the relationship, and and then we're we're actually you know I think the 
the other the other piece to it is is that you you be very diligent about about accounting for the grant and if they have a grant reporting system to be very like beyond time with your grant reports and do everything they ask you to do um, and, and then touch base with them every once in a while um, just to say hi just drop them a line and and I think that's how it's just like a you know it's like any kind of relationship you just follow up with them and you say hi every once in a while um, but that's yeah. that's kind of one example of of a recent relationship of, of how that building uh, you know what went into building that relationship and um it's it just it's hard to just get their ear every once in a while but i think knowing your story and right. and having that solid writing and working on you know spending time on that is really important that initial email mm -hmm. can make all the difference i think right i you know i think that this is a prime example of how to get your foot in the door yes peak their interest enough mm -hmm. and then the next meeting bring in some senior members of the team whether it's a board member or the executive director loop them into the conversation mm -hmm. um, and it's phenomenal that a you have a intern to help you with some of the research um, so i think that's a takeaway for a lot of other nonprofits is you know figure out what the foundation center is if you don't know what it is get mm -hmm. those reports what are what are some of the keywords that you're typing in when you do sure. the searches and, and on also we, Foundation we, Center? Pay, we also we pay a stipend to our interns that's, that's awesome something we, we don't have unpaid internships and that's it's great. it's not a whole lot but i think it's better than a lot of, like my internship was um unpaid <laughs> <laughs> yeah so but you anyway, knew that you needed to pay it forward it's yeah definitely stipend, i think it's nice you know yeah but um I have them look for the, for terminology such as social justice, civil rights, immigrants and refugees. Um, those are that's just enough to get them started. Yeah. But just that, just those terminology plus state of Minnesota. So you can look by ge geography. Right. Sometimes I just have them start just with Minnesota and civil rights, like two terms, and then boil it down. Uh, a little bit farther and then it depends on if um i mean recently we're, we're doing police reform and um you know that kind of work so i'd break it down into further terminology to depending on and and we're also trying to start a youth program so i will throw youth interest in that kind of terminology in there for them as well that's super helpful to to know and in terms of like so many nonprofits either have a closed process or an open process an invitation, mm -hmm. right? So are you only targeting the foundations that have an open process or are you still trying to get the ear of those who maybe have an invite only? Um, yeah, we're trying, I think we're trying for um, just, just about everything you know I, I guess um you know the the ones who are open um are obviously um you know i mean that that's kind of low-hanging fruit but um but yeah the invite onlys are you know we don't get those very often um that that one in saint cloud was invite only so that so that was very very nice i mean i really feel like that's be, you know, even though it wasn't a whole lot of money, it was still like a, a really um, great relationship to start. Um, and it's a win, right? Like you, it is an absolute yeah, win. for yeah. sure. And I think you can go back. We can probably ask for more money exactly. next year. Exactly. Um, and, and I think it also says to other foundations who just do that St. Cloud area, that yeah. you, and there are a few. Um, there's a few smaller family foundations there. It's like, oh, they were good at stewarding you know, this family foundation's money, they'll be okay with us too. And they're really important, doing important work in St. Cloud, Minnesota. There was um, the St. Cloud stuff. Uh, there was a, what opened doors for us kind of, I think in, in this particular situation um, was the uh, New York Times article that came out last year about St. Cloud. Um, that was really that was one of the things that um, the national funder 
looked at along along with kind of the Ilhan factor. <laughs> uh, but there was a New York Times article last year talking about the situation in St. Cloud for Somalis um, and some of the resistance and the hate groups there. And it was, I forget what month it was. Um, I think it was in summer of 2019. Um, but it really shined a, a national light on Saint, what's going on in St. Cloud, Minnesota. And people were like, oh, we're shocked, you know. Um, and and there is a, there's a lot of challenges up there, uh, more than even Minneapolis. And um, so anyway, you know, I, I think this foundation was really concerned about that. And knowing that CARE is doing something about it. Um, was very super important and, and really good for us to point out to them. So I think other foundations who care about the immigrant and refugee population in that area, I think are going to pick up their e perk up their ears now and say, oh, CARE is really doing stuff there. And this foundation cares about that. And so we do too. And, you know, ergo, um, you know, hopefully it, it opens some doors for us. Yeah, um, you know, since you have such a skill set in grant writing and um, this relationship building, I wanted to ask you, what were some things that helped you become a stronger grant writer? Oh, I, I think definitely um, the fact that uh, my predecessor, Dashina Hussein, who is the, now the executive director of Rise, yeah. Yeah. Um, what she left me some excellent uh, basic language about the founding of care. That was excellent. And I'm still using a lot of it. So, so thank you, Nashi. <laughs> and for a couple of years, I was called the new Nashi. <laughs> That's so funny. She's an amazing person. She was an amazing writer. I'm yeah. still using some, some of that uh, basic language that she had just about uh, our, the reason that we got started. And um, there was some, some really good basic language that she had. And, and that helped me, um, you know, greatly. Um, and, and I've, I've, you know, been manipulating the language and so forth to, you know, to update it and, and such, but, um, but yeah, there's some basic language in there that she wrote that, um, really helped me a lot. Um, and, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty good writer, I guess, but, and, and I, you know, yeah. I, I take a lot of help. Jelani helps me a lot with the social justice lingo. Mm -hmm. He's really, he's excellent with that. And he does, he helps me a lot with, um, using the right, I, I guess the right buzzwords sure. um, that, that the, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to call it trendy, but, but there's some social justice words that I think certain people are looking for and, and there are phrases and, and stuff like that. That's just kind of our, my, uh, you know, my take on it is, is that there are certain, there's a certain, there's certain phrasing that he knows that, that I don't. So, mm -hmm. well, so he, but I get a lot of assistance from him. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's a prime example. Like, you know, an organization might just hire a development director and say, here, go do it. But you go, have yeah. the partnership of your executive director of your team. Yeah, There's the different team. layers yeah. of people all in the process. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really phenomenal that you have this model and it's proven effective. Um, yes. So I, I want to also ask, um, you know, have there been, you know, other trainings or other things that you've done that other people can kind of learn from and try yeah. to replicate at their organizations? Sure. I think that um, my my best trainings have come from the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. And if you have a, other nonprofits, if you have a state organization um, that that offers trainings, we have a membership to uh, a council of nonprofits, go to those trainings. Uh, but the National Council on Foundations, I think, also has a lot of grant training. Um, I belong to uh, the Nonprofit Leadership Lab, which has a grant writing boot camp that I found was extremely helpful. And, and even though I've had, got experience as a grant writer, I did the boot camp just to see if I was like missing some things. Um, but they had a lot of really good advice about about the whole relationship building. I've been kind of doing my own brand of relationship building yeah. and, um, you know, just kind of winging it, I guess, just kind of doing it on my own. And I've been pretty successful at it, but they had some really good advice. 
So, so joining boot camps and, and do, you know, finding, going out there and just actively seeking grant writing uh, workshops and things of that nature. But if you have a membership to a net, to a, uh, to a statewide, uh, you know, council on founded nonprofits, that that's really, really helpful, I think. That's great. And then um, have you been able to leverage your relationship with program officers to get introduced to other foundations um, and kind of just talk through that process? Yes, absolutely. I, I think that especially once I really do get to know program officers very well, they're more than happy because um, they, they, they know each other. You know they 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 do, and and I think that they communicate with each other, and um, and, and that's why it's it's good to really like have good relationships. Don't make them mad. <laughs> <laughs> that's my one that's piece good advice. advice. Yeah, don't, don't make them mad <laughs> because they do talk to each other, <laughs> and and you know you, some of them are some of them are a little prickly, and and they some of them really is what I'm thinking of does think that she knows everything about us and and it, it's not necessarily you know the correct thing and and you know the, this one in particular that Jelani and i have kind of had to work on a little bit mm -hmm. um, but she does talk to other people and i think it's good to just keep that in mind but yes they can definitely they are usually once you've got a really good thing going with them they are more than happy to if you say to them um you know uh, there's a there's a process of you know there's an application opening opening up soon with this foundation. Do you know them? Mm -hmm. And could you drop you know could you just introduce me with a, an email or something like that? I would really appreciate it. And they're usually more than happy to do that. Yeah, but that's the beauty of um, you know uh, developing that relationship. Um, I just got an introduction to. A specific person at Ford Foundation. Nice. And and so yeah, and and you know, I've been sending LOIs to Ford Foundation for years now, and they just and we're I know we're a total fit for them. Um, you know, based on all the things that they I read in their newsletters and the funding that they do uh, grant to people, but they've hardly given anything to to anybody in Minnesota. And um, I've just needed to have, like, I need to get someone's ear there. And and I think I have the right program officer now. I'm going to, that's something that's on my plate it, 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 either today or next week that I'm going to write to this person and nice. hopefully hopefully have an in now. Um, but yeah, that's that's how we do. <laughs> great. No, I, you know, you've been able to share a lot of great gems and, uh, I hope that people listening can implement these best practices at their nonprofits. Um, and, you know, what advice do you have to, um, you know, you made a career shift. Uh, so what, what advice do you have to people who are considering um, making that shift into the nonprofit world? I, I think it's just um, very important. And I say this, we do hire a lot of interns. And I do say to some, some of them are, they're, they're actually many of them are, are kind of like, I don't know what to do with my life. And, and I said, you don't have to figure it out right now. Um, but I, I think the important thing for, for people is that if you're doing something right now and it doesn't feed you and, and doesn't feed your soul, don't, don't spend a lot of time doing it. Um, I, I had a job that, that for many years, didn't fulfill me. Uh, I didn't. I. I just didn't feel like I was giving back to anybody. Um, I didn't feel like it, I was doing anybody any good, and and that didn't feel good. And and it showed. And and now I, in this second career doing the, in the nonprofit world, I feel like I'm serving a mission, a really good mission, and I'm do. I'm benefiting people, and I really feel like I finally found my niche. Um, and and it's just it just feels really good. So that's my piece of advice: is that don't spend a lot of time doing something that doesn't make you feel good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Patty. I really You're appreciate so you. the The one thing I did want to ask is we we uh, we do love to ask our um, our guests what are three nonprofits that you personally give to and, and why, and we can close out there. 
Um, and definitely expecting Care Minnesota is one of those. So what are other <laughs> what are other charities that you personally support? Yeah, well, I do give to Care. I'm a monthly. I'm I'm a small monthly donor. <laughs> but um, I also give to Rise. That's um, reviving the Islamic Sisterhood for Empowerment. That's Nashina's. And uh, let's see. I also give to. I've been a volunteer at a community radio station, KFAI. It's mm -hmm. Fresh Air Community Radio. I've been involved there ever since I moved here to Minnesota, and I do a radio show there. I've done a couple of radio shows there, nice. uh, so I I give generously to them. Um, let's see. There's a few others. I give to Community Shares of Minnesota. They are like an employee giving plan for non for um, social justice organizations. Mm -hmm. um, I give to Headwaters. And I give. To, there's probably three more that I give to, and I can't think of who they are right now. But they're all kind of social justice organizations and and things of that nature. That's awesome, and and. You know, one of the ways in which AMCF hopes to help families be more strategic with their charitable giving uh, is through donor advised funds and yes. being able to utilize DAFs to help people um, get consolidated receipts at the end of the year. You, you just need yeah. like five charities and I'm sure there's five more that you could name. Um, Absolutely. And a donor advised fund will make it a lot easier for uh, families to contribute to all of those charities. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, thank you so much. We're, we're so grateful for your uh, work that you do at Care National and Care Minnesota. Um, thank you so much for being on the podcast and looking forward to working with you in the future as well. Great. Thank you so much for this op opportunity. This has been really a pleasure to talk with you. Likewise.